Good morning. My name is Deborah Threedy, and along with my colleague, Laura Kessler, we're pleased to welcome you to the symposium, The Other Side of Reproductive Rights, The Untold Story and Ethics of Modern Eugenics. <clears throat> eugenics means literally good breeding. What it means in practice, well, that could be and has been <laughs> debated at length. Often the term eugenics carries negative connotations associated with abuses such as castration and even genocide. The term, however, also has a more positive aspect when considered in relationship to inherited diseases, for example. We hope that by the end of the morning, we will get you thinking about all aspects of eugenics. Here's how we're going to proceed. This symposium is interdisciplinary in approach, and so we're going to begin in a very non-legal way with the reading of Stumped, my play about eugenics. Immediately after the play, there'll be a panel of three speakers followed by a question and answer session. Then we'll take a break, followed by a second panel of four speakers, another question and answer session, and then lunch. And we hope you all are inspired to continue the discussion over lunch. The play. The play was inspired by an actual case in which Linda K. Spittler Sparkman brought suit against Judge Stump and others for their role in her involuntary sterilization. The play, however, is a work of fiction. The characters, thoughts, feelings, and life stories of Linda, her mother, Ora, and Judge Stump are all invented. Any correlation between these fictional stories and the real life participants in the case is purely coincidental. And I definitely want to stress this point as later Professor Lombardo will tell us about the real Linda Sparkman. Today, Haley Royal will lead, read the part of Linda. Shar Nelson will read the part of her mother, Ora. Bob Nelson is our judge stump. And Clara Osbeck will read the role of Karen, a law student studying Linda's case. Jane England will read the stage directions. Stumped, a play in one act by Deborah Threedy. Characters, Karen, a law student, early to mid-30s, she wears pajamas. Judge Stump, elderly, late 60s to early 70s. Linda, a young woman, early 20s, blue collar, rough around the edges. Aura, Linda's mother, late 30s to early 40s, messy, poor, uneducated, a little off. Lights up on Karen. She is apart from the main playing area. It is the middle of the night and she has been studying for hours. She is reading a big law school case book with a red binding. Abruptly, she slams the book shut and throws it on the floor. Damn. You should know that it's, oh, about two o'clock in the morning. I'm buzzed on caffeine. I've been studying for hours. I've got another 50 pages for tomorrow's class on remedies, plus prepare my cross in trial ad. I'm in my second year of law school and this is nothing out of the ordinary, but I can't get past this stupid case. Lights up on an office with a desk, a chair, and a coat rack. The time is the early 1970s. The judge enters wearing his long black court robe. He puts some files down on his desk and then crosses to the coat rack. He takes off his robe and hangs it up. Underneath, he is wearing a shirt and tie. While his back is turned, a young woman, Linda, enters, wearing a coat or jacket, her hands in her pockets. Just as the judge is getting ready to put on his suit jacket, the young woman speaks. Hi, judge. The judge startles, drops his jacket, whips around. Who the hell are you? Karma. What the? You know, your past come to haunt you. Linda and the judge freeze. The lights go down on them and up on Karen. Unfairness has always pushed my button. That's probably why I ended up in law school. But your honor, that's not fair, is not a particularly persuasive legal argument. But not fair pretty accurately summarizes my reaction to this case. It's from 1978. I was alive when this case was decided. It's not some old, moldy case from the 19th century when women were lumped with children and imbeciles. It's from my lifetime. It could have happened to someone I know. 
Lights down on Karen, up on Linda and the judge. Your past come to haunt you. I have no idea what you're talking about. The office is closed for the day. You need to leave and come back tomorrow. I want to talk to you. Yet you have to make an appointment. I'm not leaving until- Listen, we... young lady, you're not allowed here. You have to leave. No. Fine. He starts to cross to his desk. Linda pulls a handgun out of her coat pocket. Stay right where you are. Look, I don't want to hurt you. I, I just want to talk to you. The case is called Stump v. Sparkman, and it belongs in some legal hall of shame. I've read it three times already, and every time I read it, I just want to go, stop! This is just wrong. I just want to talk to you. All right. What do you want to say to me? Does the name Linda Spittler mean anything to you? No. I didn't think it would. Do you remember about five years ago, a woman came in and asked for an order? Young lady, I sign many, many orders. How do you expect no me No hearing, no testimony, no evidence. Just a woman asking you to sign an order on her say-so. As I said, I sign many orders, and some of them are ex parte. You're going to have to it leave. It was an order to have a girl sterilized. Do you remember that? Law is there so people don't have to take things into their own hands. I don't think I'm being Pollyanna about this. Somebody does you wrong, you don't get a gun and go after them. You sue them. That's the American way. But... What do you do when the judge is the one who does you wrong? Then what? In order to have a girl sterilized. Do you remember that? No. How can you not remember? You just erase her chance to be a mother. You change her life forever and you don't remember? I'm sorry, I don't. Is it all right if I pick up my jacket? Uh, sure. I'm going to put this on the desk, all right? All right. The judge crosses to the desk, lays the folded coat on it, and then sits in the desk chair while Karen picks up the book, opens it, and reads. The case says, judges are not responsible to private parties for their judicial acts, however injurious may be those acts, and however much they may deserve condemnation. Did you get that? The black letter law here is that Judges can't be sued for judicial acts, no matter how much they deserve to be sued. And I get that. I mean, think about it. In every lawsuit, there's at least one disappointed party. If we just sued everyone for being wrong, no case would ever be over. Ah, but here's the rub. What exactly is a judicial act? Linda, didn't you say that was your name? I didn't say. But... Yeah, that's my name. And you want to talk to me? Yeah. Well? Lord, where to start? Two years ago, I got married. Congratulations. You don't know. And we want kids real bad, and we both had crummy childhoods, and we wanted to give our kids a better deal than we got. So we're trying and trying, and nothing's happening. So I go to this doctor to see if I can find out why, and he tells me, <clears throat> You've had a tubal ligation. And I'm like, what the hell is that? A tubal ligation severs the fallopian tube so that the egg cannot move from the ovaries. I know the... what it is. Now, back then I'm sitting there thinking, I've never had that done. The only operation I ever had was an appendectomy when I was 15. And at the same time, my brain's spinning and I'm thinking, whoa, that doctor screwed up big time. Because I'm thinking he was supposed to take out the appendix and he did the wrong thing. But something's not right, you know? Already I'm thinking something's not right. I mean, if I had appendicitis and they didn't take out my appendix, I'd be dead, right? Anyway, then the doc says that he knows I had it done because he performed it. And I asked, was there something wrong with me? And he says, no, there was no medical need, but your mother got a court order. And I say, wait, stop right there. My mother got a court order? How did she get a court order? And the doc says, you'll have to ask her. 
So I go see my mother. I tell her I know I've been sterilized, but I want to know why. Aura enters on another part of the stage, and Linda puts the gun in her pocket and crosses to her. What are you talking about? When I was 15, I didn't have an appendectomy. I was surgically sterilized. Oh, honey, that's, that's, that's crazy. Mama, I saw Dr. Hines, and he told me that you had You gone... wasn't sterilized. You, you just had your tubes tied. Mama, what do you think having your tubes tied means? Well, they, just, they just cut you open and reach inside and tie your tubes in a little bow. And, and then the eggs can't get to your belly. But after a while, the bow comes untied, and then you can have kids again. Lord Almighty, who told you that? I, well, I, I don't remember exactly a, a doctor. I, I think it was a doctor. One of the doctors at the... My tubes were cut in half. Oh. Well, uh, maybe they can sew them back together again. No. They can't. Oh. Mama... You told me I was having an appendectomy, remember? And I asked you why, because I didn't feel sick or anything. And, and you told me that they'd caught it early, but it was diseased and it had to come out. You lied to me. Why? I didn't think you'd understand. Understand what? You were so young, you, you, you wouldn't understand about it. You know, having babies. I was 15, what? I knew where babies came from. Not really. Not really. Mama, they teach you that in high school. And, and that's why there's so much, you know, babies having babies. Look who's talking. Hey, you watch yourself, Linda Kate. You may be all grown up, but I'm still your mama. Dr. Hines said you had a court order. How do you get a court order? Went to a lawyer. Why? Dr. Hines said he couldn't tie your tubes without a court order. Wait. Why were you talking to Dr. Hines about me having my tubes tied? I wanted something so she wouldn't get pregnant. I was afraid you was going to get yourself knocked up. Mama, I... You was boy crazy. I was a teenage girl. My hormones were running wild. <laughs> I was just... You were running wild. Fine. What about the pill? If you were worried about me getting pregnant, why not put me on the pill? Oh, no, no. Brother Halpin said that was a sin. That was as bad as an abortion. It, it, it was like murder, pure and simple. That's what I said. And so I told Dr. Hines, no pill, nothing like that. And then he said, well, you could have her tubes tied, but, but if you want me to do that, you'll have to get a court order. And so I asked him, where do I get me one of those? And he said, go see a lawyer. Uh, so I looked it up in the phone book, and I went to see him. He wrote me this paper, and then he told me to go see this judge. Aura puts on a hat and picks up a purse and crosses to the judge's chambers where she sits. I think about that at attorney a lot. I don't say this to excuse him because he's culpable in all this too. He could have derailed the train wreck that was Aura McFarlane right there. But I see him as this sole practitioner, just scraping by, hustling for clients, taking anything that walks in the door. Even if it is some crazy lady with a re request he had to know was outrageous. You're supposed to get a guardian ad litem to represent the daughter, and you're supposed to have a hearing. I'm still in law school, and even I know that. So maybe he's just a bad lawyer. He could have stopped Aura, but he didn't. Still, he wasn't the last line of defense. That wasn't his job. Petition to have tubal ligation performed on minor. Mrs. McFarland, why don't you tell me what this is all about? It's about my daughter, Linda Kay. The petition was one page long. One page. It's all right here in the opinion. Aura Spitler McFarlane, being duly sworn upon her oath, states that she is the natural mother of and has custody of her daughter, Linda Spitler, age 15. She's a, a, a little, uh, she's not normal. She's slow. Affiant, that's Aura. 
Affiant states that her daughter's mentality is such that she is considered to be somewhat retarded although she is attending the public schools and has been passed along with other children in her age level, even though she does not have what is considered normal mental capabilities and intelligence. Is she institutionalized? Oh, oh no, I would never do that. But she has been diagnosed as mentally retarded? Y yes. And she lives with you? Uh, yes. Well, that's admirable. Some people would just want to sweep a problem like that under the rug. Linda reacts to this and crosses to Aura. Aura turns to her and gets up from her chair, but does not leave the judge's office. While Aura and Linda speak, the judge reads the order. You told the judge I was retarded? Well, your mind doesn't work right. Mama, I'm dyslexic. I'm not retarded. You, you was having trouble in school, and it was all trouble. You, you were trouble. Further, a find has had problems as a result of said daughter leaving the home on several occasions to associate with older youth or young men. What are you talking about? You was hanging around with the bad crowd. What bad crowd? Uh, staying out all night. I never stayed out all night. Almost all night. I missed my curfew sometimes. Having stayed overnight with said youth or young men and about which incidents Affiant did not become aware of until after such incidents occurred. Sneaking around behind my back. Mama! The, there was going to be unfortunate circumstances. I, I could see that. Affiant believes that it is the best interest of said child that a tubal ligation is performed on minor daughter to prevent unfortunate circumstances from occurring. Judge Stump finds a pen and he signs the order. You were going to end up pregnant. And what if I did? Would that have been so terrible it if I just... ruined your life. It ruined mine. You think I ruined your life? Oh, honey, I, I didn't mean you. I, I, I meant being pregnant. There you go, Ms. McFarland. Good luck with your daughter. I never realized how many women had been involuntarily sterilized until I went to law school and read their cases. You don't hear about them. I tell my non-law school friends, and they have no idea what I'm talking about. We worry about having a child we don't want, but there are women out there who want kids and aren't allowed to have them. Women with mental disabilities. Poor women, often minority, black, Hispanic, Native American? The kind of person someone decides we don't need any more of. And it's still legal. Involuntary sterilization is still legal. What happened to Linda could happen today. While Karen is speaking, Aura exits. Linda takes the gun out of her pocket again. That petition was one page long. And your point is? You gave her a court order to have me sterilized based upon one lousy page? Yes. Did it ever occur to you that she might be lying? No. Why should she do that? She was your mother. She had your best interests at heart. Are you serious? She was trying Stop! to- Stop! <sighs> this calls for a professional. Karen puts a suit jacket over her pajama top. She crosses to the judge. The petition alleges Linda is retarded, but there was no opinion to that effect by any medical expert. Isn't that correct? That's correct. No testimony or affidavit from a psychiatrist? No. Or a psychologist? No. Or even a school counselor? No. Nothing but the statement of Mrs. McFarlane? The sworn statement. That's competent evidence. The sworn but uncorroborated statement. Have you ever known an affiant to lie? Yes, of course, but I didn't But what know. about due process? Whatever happened to all those procedural safeguards enshrined in the Constitution? Notice and the opportunity to be heard. Linda didn't have notice of this petition, did she? No. She didn't have the chance to tell you her side of the story, did she? No. She was a minor and yet she wasn't represented by a guardian ad litem, was she? No. You could have appointed a guardian ad litem, couldn't you? Yes. But you didn't. You relied on a one-page, one-page affidavit, didn't you? An affidavit from the girl's mother. The mother was entitled to do what she thought was in the best interests of her child. 
If the child had been in an auto accident, the mother could decide on her medical treatment. This was no different. Wrong! It was different! If Linda had been injured, yes, her mother could have consented to treatment, but that would be medically required treatment. Or McFarlane was in your chambers asking for a court order because without one, no doctor, no hospital would sterilize a healthy girl, only 15 years old for God's sake. Is there a question pending or are you just giving an oration to the jury? Did it ever occur to you that the mother may not have been acting in Linda's best interests? No, it didn't. Did it ever occur to you that the mother may not have been behaving rationally? No. Did it ever occur to you that the mother may have been alleging that her daughter was retarded as an excuse for her own inability to parent? It didn't matter whether the girl was retarded or not. What? Of course it did. I didn't need to see the girl. I could see the mother. I am now going to do what trial advocacy instructors say you should never do. I'm going to ask a question I don't know the answer to. And what did seeing the mother tell you? Some people shouldn't breed. The mother was poor, uneducated, maybe even a little retarded herself. She was young to have a 15-year-old daughter, so she probably had her when she was about the same age, probably out of wedlock. She didn't have the same name as her daughter. She was McFarlane, the daughter was Spittler. Either out of wedlock or she was on her second marriage. The daughter was running wild, and no wonder the mother couldn't control herself, much less her daughter. That's why you never ask a question you don't know the answer to. You'll get an answer you don't like and aren't prepared to deal with. And you think that's justified? She was poor white trash. And her daughter was going to turn out the same. Just keep replicating the same problem. Look, the socially unfit are a drain on this country. We just fought a war in Vietnam. If this country can ask its best and brightest to give the last full measure of devotion, put their lives on the line for all of us, then we as a society can certainly call upon the weakest links to make this lesser sacrifice to not reproduce, to break the cycle of poverty and ignorance. While speaking, the judge has gotten up and put his robe back on. And who are you to challenge me? You're standing there in your pajamas, for God's sake. If you showed up looking like that in my court, I'd have you thrown in jail for contempt. You think you can be an attorney? Don't make me laugh. You're nothing but an imposter, play acting the part of an attorney. Now. Go on. Get out of my sight. Karen crosses back to her books and takes off her suit jacket. The judge crosses to his desk and picks up the court files he placed there and examines them, ignoring the two women. Where do you think you're going? You're not done here. Sorry, I... He's right. Who do I think I am, pretending that I know what I'm doing? Maybe I don't have what it takes. Maybe I don't have the balls to be an attorney. I don't know. I, I just don't know what else to do. You don't know? Well, I do. The judge has started for his courtroom. Linda points the gun at the judge. Stop right there. The judge stops and turns to look at Linda. So one look at my mother, and you not only judge her whole life, but you judge my life, too? Well, let me tell you about my mother. I suppose now you're going to tell me some sad Sarah Sob story. Yes, I am. And you're going to listen. My mother was born in a holler in the hills of West Virginia. When she was 13, she was seduced, no, raped, by a man who lived down the road. She told no one. And no one paid her much mind. No one noticed she was getting a little plump. When the baby came, that would be me. And the whole sorry tale was told, my grandpa took his shotgun and hunted down the guy and marched him to the preacher. A good old-fashioned shotgun wedding, which in his mind solved the whole problem. After which, my daddy took his new bride and their bouncing baby, got on that old hillbilly highway, and headed up north to Indiana, Indiana where he got a job in a factory. 
And then one day, he upped and left us. My mama took his place on the line, and for eight hours a day, she picks up one piece of metal and puts it on another. She has no idea why or what it is she's making, and she doesn't care. So, yeah, call her poor white trash. But she did the best she could with what she had. She was trying in the best way she knew how to give me a better life, better than the crappy hand she'd been dealt. I know that, but someone should have stepped in and stopped her, and that someone was you. Linda and the judge are in a freeze, with Linda pointing the gun at the judge. Linda Spittler Sparkman, that's her married name, never really took a gun to Judge Stump's chambers. Linda, the gun, please. Linda hands the gun to Karen, then steps out of the scene, but remains visible on stage. While Karen speaks, the judge restarts the play by exiting and then re-entering, replicating his movements from the beginning, as if he had just entered his chambers. He crosses to the desk, puts down the files, crosses to the coat rack, takes off his robe, etc. What she did was sue Judge Stump in a court of law. The trial court threw her case out, saying you can't sue the judge. Appeals were taken, and the case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. It's their opinion I'm studying now. And the Supreme Court says a judge is not responsible to private parties in their civil actions for his judicial acts. While she speaks the following, Karen crosses to Linda, who takes off her coat and hands it to Karen. Karen puts it on and puts the gun in her pocket. So what's a judicial act? Is signing an order a judicial act? Sure. But is signing an order without any kind of due process absolutely in violation of Linda's constitutional rights? Is that a judicial act? Not so clear. There was a dissent in the Supreme Court. They say Justice Stewart was so upset by this case, he read his dissent for the bench. He said that what Judge Stump did was beyond the pale, that there was nothing judicial about it. But the majority said what judges do is sign orders, so signing an order, even an improper, horrible, vile, inexcusable order, is still a judicial act. I don't know what happened to Linda K. I like to think she moved on, adopted a couple kids, made a life. But maybe she's still living in some trailer park with a poodle, mourning children she never had. Maybe Leo, that's her husband, divorced her. But she was shafted by the law, and something needs to be done, and I'm going to do it. Karen steps into Linda's place. We see the same stage picture from the beginning of the play, only now Karen is standing in Linda's shoes. Hi, Judge. The judge startles, drops his jacket, whips around. Who the hell are you? Karma. What the hell are you? You know your past come to haunt you? The office is closed for the day. You need to come back, leave, come back tomorrow. I'm not going anywhere until we've had Listen, a young lady, you're not allowed here. You have to leave. No. Fine. He starts to cross to his desk. Karen pulls the handgun out of her coat pocket. Stay right where you are. We're having this little chat, whether you like it or not. All right. What do you want to say to me? Do you remember a while back you signed an order for a 15-year-old girl to be sterilized? No. You're lying, Judge Stump. The case went to the Supreme Court. How many of your cases went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court? I was exonerated. You most certainly were not. You were immune, legally immune. You couldn't be held to account in a court of law, but there are other kinds of consequences. Karen has been pointing the gun at the judge's head. Now she deliberately lowers the gun so it's pointing at the judge's crotch. She fires the gun. The judge grabs his crotch and crumples to the ground with a scream. Karen puts the gun down on the judge's desk. I could never really shoot someone. You can get up now, Bob. <laughs> The judge stands, brushes himself off, and sits. Karen moves back to her law books. But there are other kinds of consequences, like metaphoric castration in the heavily caffeinated, semi-delirious 
late night fever dreams of generations of women law students. Unfairness still pushes my button. It's why I'm here and why I'm staying here, learning to be a lawyer, hoping that whatever happens down the road, when my Linda Kay walks into my office, I'll have what it takes to do right by her, that I'll be able to persuade whatever court I'm arguing before that when law fails, we all lose. In the meantime, metaphoric castration versus actual real life surgical castration? Is that fair, Linda? No, but it's a start. End of play. Thank you.